I want to say a word about uh, our panel, and I'll uh, handle the uh, uh, microphone to, to the first speaker. We'll be three speakers. Uh, we won't necessarily, at least not exclusively, talk about Kaplan, Mordechai Kaplan in Israel. There's a lot to say about it, and we will welcome questions uh, and, um, and, and remarks uh, for the later discussion. Uh, what we'll bring here are three perspectives from three of the Israeli scholars that uh, uh, take part in this conference, and the four or five of us uh, from Israel, if you include uh, Rachel Shabbat uh, 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 in the list, are part of a larger group of uh, Israelis who write and uh, discuss uh, Kaplan uh, in Israel nowadays. Uh, there's a steady and, and clear growth of uh, interest in Kaplan, so you might hear some Israelis' perspectives about Kaplan, and to a certain extent, also uh, perspectives on Kaplan in Israel. I will just add one word. We heard a lot about uh, Kaplan and the reform movement yesterday. I. Uh, uh, have the honor of serving as a chair of the Israeli Council of Reform Rabbis in Israel. And um, I served for many years as a director of the uh, Israel Rabbinic Program at Hebrew Union College. Uh, when we, um, in one of the first years, years of my watch, when we wanted to create a poster telling people, recruiting people, but telling people about the program, uh, the idea that I came up with was to take a bunch of uh, books as, um, as a symbol. And then the, the regular writing, how wonderful it would be if you would come. Um, and we didn't want to order them, so it was not kind of uh, one upon the other, but kind of a messy uh, uh, number of books. Um, uh, but the most visual one was a... Uh, strong right, uh, red book with the white uh, uh, letters, Judaism as a civilization. And yes, there was some uh, figurative uh, uh, reason to it. It was uh, really um, uh, very visible, but there was a clear, very, very clear uh, contentual uh, reasoning uh, behind it we felt that in the mixture of Hebrew and English books that we want to represent as the welcoming uh, treasure of uh, knowledge and welcoming treasure of thought uh, that might uh, lead people to reform rabbinate in Israel today, uh, Judaism as a civilization is a vital and uh, very, very productive uh, cornerstone. And um, I think that if you go to many of the Israeli reform congregations, you would find a Kaplan-wise recon reconstructionist sentiment, maybe even more than in some of the reconstructionist congregations here in the United States. So I just wanted to add this to, uh, to the discussion of yesterday, and uh, I'll handle uh, the microphone uh, to uh, my friend uh, Nadav Berman. Good morning. First, I wish to thank Eric Kaplan and uh, Dan Siderbaum and all the dear uh, uh, people behind this significant uh, conference for the opportunity of participating in it. So, the spiritual, intellectual, The spiritual intellectual uh, atmosphere of Israel, which obviously has many faces, suffers, I think, from a series of ideological and social splits. These splits are numerous, religious versus secular, self versus society, material or body versus spirit or spiritual, and they have, of course, various intellectual environmental causes. However, we may divide these splits into two distinct types, tensions between identities, for example, religious and secular, and between populations, for example, Ashkenazi and Sephardic 
the controversial Lebo uh, controversial, sorry, a Jewish uh, scholar and thinker, Professor Ishayao Lebovich, seems to have symbolized some of, the, of these splits by casting a series of schisms into the Israeli collective discourse and by emphasizing certain descriptive and prescriptive ethical, religious, normative aspects of these splits, he seemingly deepened them to the extent that they might con uh, be described as uh, dichotomous. The foundational Lebovician dichotomy from which the three splits I will discuss below appear to uh, derive in Lebovich's thought, uh, thought is a classification he emphasized between uh, the intentional observance of co commandments for their own sake, lishma, and what he saw as not for their own sake, shelo lishma, which he held to be a mere secular, egocentric, idolatrous act and not the religious deed. This later category includes, for example, any performance of mitzvah when one's intention is uh, focused on the ethical or utilitarian value of the deed, for instance, in the case of helping the needy, uh, rather than a pure subservience to God. This dichotomy seemingly had much influence on uh, the anyhow dichotomized Israeli sphere. Could a certain holistic way of thinking help in mediating such dichotomies? Assuming the immediate context of this conference, I'm quite sure you know where, the, where this is going. Laugh. <laughs> Anyhow, my goal today is to present a, an analysis of Leibovitch and uh, Kaplan's thought and to further explore how Kaplan's holistic thought may contribute for contending with some Israeli versions of dichotomous thinking, as well as coping with some Israeli educational dichotomist challenges. The following argument will comprise four parts. First, I, would, I will explain what I mean by the terms dichotomy and holism. Second, I will present three perceptional elements, uh, elementary, sorry, splits in Ishayao Leibovitch's thought. Third, I will explore Mordechai Kaplan's holistic opinions regarding these very issues. Fourth, some educational positive outcomes that may uh, result from implementing more of the Kaplanian attitude in Israeli sphere will be suggested. So, first we need to define our use of two terms, dichotomy and holism. Regarding dichotomy, there is a basic difference between dichotomy and distinction. While distinction functions as a conceptual tool for analysis, dichotomy makes a stronger claim as to the manifestation of distinct phenomena in reality, ignoring the interweaving and sometimes inconsistent ways in which the world and humans seem to conduct themselves. As for the term holism, I refer to a general pragmatic way of conceptualizing self, society, and culture as subjects that are better understood and treated in holistic terms than in dualistic or other framings. In addition, holism here means an assumption or axiom that uh, a, certain, a certain unity is preferable rather than rigid classification. It is also important to know the difference between holism and totality. Holism affords its components a, a place within a plurality while totality is erasing it. It is also important to distinct holism from the term monism, which is used for describing a reductionist philosophy that explain reality according to a single element. In what follows, I will attempt to undertake comparison between two very different figures, Kaplan and Leibovitch. While a deep act actual and metaphoric ocean stretched between them, these two men shared some fundamental outlooks. For example, pro-Zionism and the conception of history as a naturalistic secular realm. In addition, both Kaplan and Leibovitch were perceived by a major part of their receptive, respective sorry, communities at large, American, Israeli, as culture heroes. However, at the same time, they articulated very different attitudes. A certain amount of generalization is inescapable in this uh, kind of comparison I will do my best to exercise caution and remain, remain fair as I proceed with the following analysis. So, I would like 
to uh, concentrate here on three significant Leibovitchian th uh, splits, which are not pure philosophical dichotomies, but uh, stem from the elementary dichotomy of Lishma and Shelo Lishma, presented above. The first of which I'm going to speak is a split between mind and matter, or mind and body. Also, Leibovitch claims that generally the world of fulfilling commandments is defined by conducting physical rituals and not uh, merely spiritual realm. His main emphasis was the criteria of intentionality, namely the aspect of fulfilling commandments for their own sake. In his opinion, this should be without any consideration of material or even spiritual gratification. Leibovitch, <laughs> it was his gesture. Um, and it is uh, the only way to achieve, quote, emancipation from the bondage of nature. Leibovitch emphasized the unbridgeable gap between the material and the intentional aspects of human life, and he hi highlighted the centrality of the subjective point of view, which manifests in the supremacy of will over matter. This is very briefly. A second split is between individual and society. Leibovitch's early thought could be characterized as Catholic in the generic sense in that he placed a major emphasis on the collective and common aspects of Judaism, or Israeli Judaism. In contrast, the later Leibovitchian thought was dominated by individuality, mainly because Leibovitch was disappointed by the problematic place religion had come to occupy double meaning in a Israeli Jewish politics. Third, split is religious versus secular. Following his either or dichotomy between fulfilling commandments lishma versus shelo lishma, Lebovich fundamentally reduced the test of Jewishness, religiousness, to the sole criterion of lishma. Surprisingly, he applied it to the national realm in a generalized uh, extrapolative way, either the state of Israel is a religious project, or, as he argued, it is not. With these three dichotomies, Leibovitch actually redefined Ju Judaism legalistically and formalistically to the exclusion of formal understandings of Judaism that placed a value on Jewish heritage or traditions, the centrality of uh, the land of Israel, the state of Israel, the Hebrew language, Jewish peoplehood, and even Jewish thought. Where does Kaplan's thought stand uh, relative to Leibovitch's dichotomizing Jewish worldview? We shall now see. It seems to me that in this context, Kaplan's holism is embodied in three major realms that correspond to Leibovitch's dichotomies. The holism of mind and matter, or body, the holism of self, and a society or individual in society and the holistic uh, conception of a Jewish identity. In my doctoral work, I argue that the first two of the above aspects express the uh, comprehensive anti-Cartesian move anti-Descartes, anti-Cartesian move uh, in American pragmatism. We shall now examine Kaplan's implicit opposition to Leibovitch on all the three above topics. Let me expand on the main features of Kaplan's holism while noting the pragmatic themes. So, denying Cartesian dualism of mind and matter, or body uh, and soul, maybe, the Kaplanian ethical holism means an ethical positive attitude toward material existence and conduct and approaching the human being as holistically integrated. Kaplan wrote, the fundamental error of traditional assumption concerning human nature was that since men ten tended to succumb to worldly temptations, they should as far as possible withdraw from the world and devote themselves to contemplation of God and a communion with him. Indeed, some medieval ascetic trends in Judaism explicitly accepted the ju uh, dualistic division Recalling them and certain modern rationalists who seemingly neglected certain material moral aspects of human existence, this Kaplanian Jewish holistic notion cannot be considered trivial. Second is the holism of individual society. In pragmatic tradition, which Kaplan was acquainted 
Uh, the holism of self and society was deeply rooted in the critique of the dichotomy between individual and society implied by Cartesian philosophy. Kaplan pragmatically understood self and society as interdependent. Like the poet John Dunn, Kaplan thought of the individual not as an island, but as a social creature. The social aspect of this holism, or continuum, as Alan Lazarov named it, refers in the Jewish context largely to the local community or congregation and to the Jewish people as a whole, though it may include other groups such as uh, American people, or of course, all human beings. Kaplan emphasized uh, the social holistic aspect many times. The con uh, at the congregational uh, level, for example, when Kaplan asked whether a Jew can satisfy his need for religion without being a member of an organic community, he responded only through a comprehensive organic community founded on the principle of diversity and unity can synagogues sat satisfy their members' need for a religious identification with Jewish people. In Kaplan's thought, this uh, human social holism has even wider circles, such as the national and the universal, as mentioned, which are actually extensions of the core individual society holism. Kaplan had a, a holistic understanding also of Jewish identity, as embodied primarily in the concept, in the concept of civilization which integrates the components of peoplehood, ethics, religion, land and state of Israel, diaspora, Hebrew language, destiny, tradition, culture, history, and art. This may sound like a grocery list, but each of the terms is uh, rudimentary and vastly significant. Every Jew may identify on this uh, list main values that she or he cherishes, while no sole identity ingredient innately takes precedence over the all others. This democratization reflects Kaplan's anti-foundationalism and further demonstrates his links to pragmatism, as I argue in an additional context in my work in progress. Summing up this brief comparative analysis, we may say that the comparison between Leibovitch and Kaplan helped us in clarifying some pragmatic aspects of Kaplan's thought. It may be suggested that the unique Kaplanian pragmatic holism, which was pluralistic and progressive, renders his legacy an intellectual tool for dealing with some of the wounds of dichotomized Israeli society, which we are just moving now. Some scholars have already argued that the dichotomous Leibovitchian views had a deleterious influence on uh, Israel, Israeli society, like my father-in-law, uh, in confluence with other factors, of course. Truly, there are counter voices within Israeli society, especially that of Israeli Jewish renewal and some forms of modern orthodoxy, which try to offer non-dichotomous approaches and articulate mediating voices to counter extremism. In my view, Kaplan's holistic and pragmatic thought offers a untapped potential for contributing its share towards a certain rehabilitation of Israeli society from its dichotomous maladies. Here's one suggestion about the link between pragmatism and conflicts resolution. So I will thus offer some problematic aspects related to the three Leibovitchian dichotomies reviewed above as expressed in the field of national Israeli education system. And then I will respectively describe holistic planning approaches that might potentially address these issues. The examples I present are cursory and should be considered merely as an introduction to a comprehensive approach. So Israeli schools seem to suffer from a hyper emphasis on the theoretical aspect of learning at the expense of cultivating physical, active, personal, social learning modes. This seems seem to uh, enlarge the attention uh, deficit classroom challenges. The desired rehabilitation may be brought about by employing activity-based learning strategies more extensively. Kaplan's holistic anthropology called for a deep ethical 
positive uh, uh, relationship between the human uh, mind and body. It may therefore serve as a basis for expanding activity-based learning, which bears tremendous potential for cultivating creativity, joy, and sustainability through agricultural work, for example. Such an approach might allow school students to study their theoretical subjects with greater receptivity by creating the conditions where they can physically be, can be physically receptive to learning. In the case of youth, middle and high school, it has a potential of helping them to get through one of the most emotionally challenging periods of their body-spirit relations. Okay. Second, Israeli society is historically polarized between what can be roughly described as Haredi collectivist and secular individualistic sectors. The Israeli education system, like many other systems around the world, makes only a small effort to connect uh, youth to their communities. The frontal framing of uh, the typical classroom expands a sense of uh, social alienation and serves as a major tool of individualization a legitimate goal in itself, but one that unfortunately occurs at the expense of a necessary socialization. Kaplan's thought has the potential to forge a closer relationship between the individual and her or his uh, community. For example, schools, school projects that create community events celebrating Jewish festivals within the various congregations, community contexts represented in uh, the student uh, body, tending community gardens, etc. Third aspect, the common Israeli understanding of Jewish identity is somehow imprisoned in a rigid dichotomy. On the one side of the fence, many religious Jews perceive their religious identity narrowly, while on the other, many secular Jews vehemently shun any association with religiosity and its trappings. This polarization is both reflected and reinforced by Israeli formally segregated education system divided, divided into the national or mamlachti, mamlachti, so-called secular system and the national religious mamlachti dati system. The many Israeli Jews who are part of the traditional conservative or unaffiliated even uh, Israeli communities are uh, falling somewhere in the mi middle of the religious secular divide and left with difficult educational choices and struggle for recognition within this dichotomized public domain. In 2008, the Knesset, Knesset Israel, legislated the founding of a third national in integrative stream, Chinuch Meshalev. While the law is a step in the right direction, affording some freedom and support for isolated local initiatives, recent governments have not invested special efforts in promoting such schools or in cultivating a public discussion regarding the various forms that uh, they might uh, assume. Within neoliberal Israeli society, some non-governmental organizations have assumed the role of supporting this uh, third stream, which is blessed for itself. One types of uh, such integrative meshutaf schools uh, that seems to be catching on in contemporary Israel is based on a religious secular tracking system within a single school, where, for example, morning prayers are held for religious uh, children, while secular students instead attend a daily spiritual intellectual substitute. It turns out that aside from the valuable socialization that occurs from the very encounter, encounter between uh, different sectors, this kind of structuring unfortunately seem, seems to preserve and reinforce the former religious secular dichotomy. Kaplan would probably support the existence of a plural Israeli integrative uh, educational options, of course. But if we would think what could be uh, his preferable option, it would seemingly oppose the idea of a secular students, especially in elementary school, being excluded from religious com communal practice. In Kaplan's vision, I think, basic religious practice ought 
uh, ought to be a common Jewish meeting ground. He would ostensibly advocate for Jewish schools that maintains a pluralistic uh, texture while offering a certain united Jewish curriculum. I am finishing soon. Kaplan's thought does not lack uh, difficulties. Among them are, are questions regarding his impersonal God uh, uh, concept uh, talked yesterday uh, in length. His uh, modern seemingly exaggerated optimism regarding the goodness of human nature's potentialities, the pretension of making a sharp distinct distinction between the moral and the ritual, and henceforth the tension between the fluidity of ritual practice and the arguable need for a pan-Jewish uh, religious common language. But despite these uh, and maybe other questions, however, Kaplan's thought is an untapped source of deep inspiration for cultivating uh, Jewish holistic frameworks, and any Israeli Jew will do well will, would do well to become acquainted with Kaplan's thought as a guide for challenging current dichotomous structures. And the Israeli education system may be an appropriate starting point for applying some relevant insights. Thank you. We don't read biographies uh, in this conference, so we want to thank Nadav Berman and to invite uh, Dr. Ari Ackerman. Thank you. I just also want to echo my thanks to Eric and Dan for organizing such a wonderful and well-organized uh, conference, and thank all the attendees for braving the weather. Um, I'm going to talk about Kaplan's Jewish nationalism, and it's going to continue some of the themes that Nadav uh, offered. Um, one can conceive of modern Jewish thought as a series of attempts to balance three diverse ideals, the growth and development of the Jewish nation, the self-fulfillment of the individual, and the betterment of humanity as a whole. This is, in other words, modern Jewish thinkers often try to navigate between the competing challenges of nationalism, universalism, and individualism. This is certainly the case among Jewish nationalistic thinkers, Zionist and non-Zionist alike. Obviously, a Jewish thinker with a nationalistic orientation valorizes strengthening Jewish collective solidarity. But he or she must also consider the impact of Jewish nationalism on the individualistic and universalistic aspiration of modern Jews. Often, the Jewish nationalist will argue for the superior of, superiority of Jewish nationalism over individualism and universalism, and the need for subordinating these aspirations to the ultimate goal of promoting a Jewish national renaissance. For instance, Achada Am in his first essay, Lo Zu Aderech, inveighs against what he views as the excessive individualism of the Jewish people in exile, which he concedes as a sign of a weak nationalistic ethos. By contrast, in Mordechai Kaplan's philosophy, these three values stand front and center concurrently. Indeed, an Archimedean point for Kaplan's philosophy is his attempt to forge together individualistic, nationalistic, and universalistic values. That is, Kaplan views each of these values as primary. None are able to best the others, and none are subordinate to, the other, to one another. Kaplan is equally committed to the self-actualization of individual Jews, the creation of group loyalty among them, and the promotion of the advancement of humanity as a whole. Moreover, apart from arguing for their foundational status, Kaplan claims that these values are complementary. Not only can they mutually coexist, but each is necessary for the development of the others. For Kaplan, fidelity to one's nation and to humanity is a precondition of individual growth. Likewise, human and national flourishing cannot be accomplished without sensitivity to the needs of the individual. I will commence, therefore, with an exploration of Kaplan's nationalism in general, and then proceed to examine 
the individualistic and universalistic strands in Kaplan's philosophy. We will see that he employs concepts and formulations from the romantic collectivistic nationalistic tradition, particularly through the conduit of Achada Am's philosophy, but his nationalism is liberal, individualistic, and universalistic at its core. Kaplan's nationalism is grounded in the principle that human beings tend to need to interact with one another. This natural pr propensity towards group association leads over the time to the formation of nations. By accumulated intersubjective experiences, nations possess collective personalities composed of common needs, desires, values, and meanings. Years of living together produces a national will to live, a social momentum that directs the nation towards ensuring its stability and strengthening its way of life. In this sense, nations are social organisms. This is, a lot, this is coming really from the, the romantic, collectivistic, nationalistic tradition. They're social organisms which act, like others living, which act like other living beings by working towards ensuring their survival and growing and developing in a natural manner. They also resemble other living beings in possessing an inalienable right to continue their existence. Kaplan thus criticizes cosmopolitanism with its disregard of the necessity of particular social and national entities. From our brief depiction of, of his nationalism thus far, the centrality of collective consciousness, that is subjective elements and not objective factors, in Kaplan's nationalistic ideology is readily apparent. For Kaplan, nationalism is at bottom a group outlook engendered by accumulated group experiences. Kaplan then pays particular attention to the experiences that most effectively bring about this collective personality. This pursuit leads Kaplan to explore the social dimensions of religion. Aided by Durkheim's groundbreaking work in the sociology of religion, Kaplan underscores the ability of religion to foster a shared mentality, particularly through group sancta. Kaplan realizes, however, that religion is not the sole building block from which national consciousness is forged. Each nation is composed of essential characteristics which contribute to the formation of the collective mentality that distinguishes it from other nations. Kaplan includes among the constituent components of a nation, and here I'm gonna um, draw from the grocery list that Nadav already uh, offered, a homeland that allows for intensive and sustained group interaction, a language and literature that expresses and stores the ideals and experiences of a people, and folk ways or social habits that regulate the social interactions between members of a nation and not just the relationship to God. These elements, as well as national art and educational system and social sanctions and institutions contribute to the formation of a national civilization which reinforces and concretizes the social consciousness of the nation. They promote collective experiences that are distinct and non-transferable. Kaplan's understanding of the, const of the constitutive elements of a nation colors his Jewish philosophy. In other words, up to now I've been talking about how he views nationalism in general. He sees um, the world divided into nations. He talks about the, uh, the deep impact of nations on the individuals. Now we just want to very briefly connect that to his Jewish philosophy. Indeed, at the center of his Jewish philosophy, as attested to by the title of his magnum opus, is the belief that Judaism is a national civilization. He conceives of the Jewish religion as contributing to the formation of a national consciousness. Likewise, Judaism possesses the other elements that constitute a civilization. Jews resided in a homeland, and initially during this period, the disparate tribes that are the source of the Jewish people were forged into a unified nation. Kaplan thus deviates from the biblical account that the Jews emerged as a nation outside of their homeland. The Jews also developed a national language and corpus of literature written in that language. As Kaplan notes, even when Hebrew was no longer the vernacular of the Jews, it still retains its status as the primary vehicle of cultural expression. For Kaplan, this cultural tradition was accompanied by an all-encompassing system of folkways 
that generated social standards in ethics, laws for marriage and property, and all other institutions that human society has developed. Kaplan also underscores that Jews established an unrivaled educational system, a tradition of art, and a shifting but enduring framework of social sanctions and institutions. Hence, he concludes that the Jewish people must be defined as a nation, and modern Jewish prescriptions must incorporate this basic assumption. As I have noted, Kaplan avers that Jews need to foster a relationship to the Jewish nation and view it as a social organism, organism with a will to live. Yet despite his belief in the importance of the nation and his organic nationalistic frame formulation, Kaplan maintains that the function of social and national frameworks is to service the individual and not vice versa. And here, in, I think this is a very important point, and in this regard, I, I, my understanding of Kaplan is somewhat different from um, other uh, presenters yesterday. I think Kaplan argues that Judaism is not self-justifying. In other words, Judaism has to serve the individual, and if not, it doesn't have justification. That is, although he employs organic nationalistic rhetoric, rhetoric, he views nationalism essentially in functional terms. And one of the primary functions of the nation is satisfying the needs of its individual members. In this vein, Kaplan declares, and I'm quoting here from Judaism as a Civilization, and here I think he really gets into his understanding of the relationship between self and society. Like all other ethicists, Jewish thinkers, when dealing with the relationship of the individual to the community, have often taken for granted that the loyalty of the individual to the community must be treated as an ethical absolute in the nature of Kant's categorical imperative. They invariably disregard the aspect of mutuality without which ethical value, values are impossible. There is nothing mercenary or degrading in the fact that unless the community furthers the well-being of the individual, it has no claim upon his or her allegiance or co cooperation. I'm just going to read again that last sentence because I think it's crucial. Um, unless the community furthers the well-being of the individual, it has no claim on, upon his or her allegiance or cooperation. Thus, Kaplan does not view the nation or the community as authoritative entities that can require the individual to forgo entirely his or her personal needs and interests for the good of the collective. Kaplan's philosophy does make demands of Jews. He views the community as able to establish criteria for membership and prescribe rules, laws, and ritual practices. And the individual at times must balance his or her interests with those of the collective. However, the communal authority and its ability to make demands are predicated on its serving the needs of individual Jews. As Kaplan underscores in his discussion of the commandments, the law exists for man and not man for the law. Kaplan accordingly does not place the blame for assimilation on the Jews whose attachment to the Jewish collective has weakened. Instead, he sees the desire for assimilation as natural in a situation where the nation no longer serves the needs of the individual. This need for self-realization validates the Jews looking to American society to fill his or her needs when the Jewish community fails in this regard. Consequently, he displays none of the venomous enmity towards assimilation that one finds in the writings of Achad Am. In contrast, Kaplan blames Jewish leaders and scholars who in his mind have not reconstructed Judaism appropriately and have failed to provide a compelling interpretation of Judaism for the individual. Kaplan also argues for the compatibility of nationalism and universalism. Okay, I've discussed the relationship between nationalism and individualism. Now I'm going to shift to the relationship between nationalism and universalism. And his argument is predicated on reconfiguring the purpose of nationalism and the nature and the nature of its authority. He opposes forms of nationalism that focus exclusively on group survival or the acquisition of political power in the form of statehood, 
which pits one nation or state against others. Instead, like a chara'am, he portrays nationalism as the cultural manifestation of a group that represents universal values through its particular language, folklore, literature, and other aspects of its cultural heritage. He views then cultural, cultures as complementary entities, each contributing to the formation of a rich and diverse human mosaic. Consequently, Kaplan allows for national cultural hyphenated identities whereby individuals can be members of multiple nations and nationalism should not be identified exclusively with status nationalism. He also avers that nations must work together for their mutual benefit and towards the development of a unified, integrated human society. Kaplan's internationalist orientation is most evident when he advocates the existence of a world state and the subordination of particular states to it. Kaplan sees the Jewish nation then due to its historical development, cultural heritage, and current state of affairs as uniquely, uniquely qualified to re-educate other nations regarding a nationalistic conception compatible with a universalist orientation. As the only nation that successfully resisted the demands of conquering nations, Jews were taught by their historical experience the need to foster a non-imperialistic form of nationalism supporting human progress. This form of nationalism, however, will require the Jew to abandon one central feature of their traditional self-perception, the notion of the Jewish people. And there's a certain tension here. On the one hand, he says that the Jews are most uniquely qualified to advance this universalistic conception of the state, but then he also says that um, one has to abandon, which abandon the idea of chosenness um, and not even reinterpret it. For all his emphasis on the need to reinterpret seminal theological concepts, Kaplan refuses to apply his functional hermeneutic to the notion of divine election. He finds the notion problematic on pragmatic, ethical, and rational grounds and argues that the sense of arrogance, superiority, and competitiveness that permeate from it prevents international and interreligious cooperation. Now, in the couple minutes that is left, I just want to briefly um, talk about his Zionism and here again try to understand how it weaves together nationalistic, individualistic, and universalistic motifs. Kaplan's commitment to nationalism and his balancing it with a dedication to individualism and universalism also manifest themselves in his Zionist theology. More than any other modern interpretation of Judaism, apart from his own, Kaplan pays tribute to Zionism and its efforts towards the restoration of Zion as the homeland for the Jews. He views it as the most commendable effort of modern Judaism to adjust itself to the formidable challenges of the emancipation and the contemporary world by establishing a national center in the land of Israel. But unlike his vision for the, but like his vision for the American Jewish com community, Kaplan's conception of the Jewish state and the Zionist movement is animated by his commitment to individualism and universalism. One instance of an individualistic strain in his Zionism, and there are many, and I'm just going to focus on one, is his view that the state must serve its individual citizens. Kaplan's approach to the relationship between the Zionist collective and the individual then transvalues the classic Zionistic ethos, which calls for the individual sacrifice for the good of the Israel state and the Zionist movement. At the time of his formation of his, new, of his new Zionist ideology, the best representative of classical Zionist ethos was David Ben-Gurion's statism. He called for the total commitment of, of the citizen to the state and the subordination of, for, of personal fulfillment to national need. Kaplan does not directly criticize Ben-Gurion. He does, however, critique an early Zionist theoretician, a Am, in this regard. Kaplan accuses him of bringing about the renaissance of the Jewish people by urging substitution of loyalty and devotion to the Jewish national being in place of individualistic yearning for personal salvation. Kaplan, by contrast, advocates a form of Zionism that places the individual at the center 
and a political conception that views the nation as a vehicle for, facil for facilitating the development of human personality and actualizing individual human potential. Apart from individualism, Kaplan's Zionist vision is shaped through his commitment to universalism. The universalism of the Zionist movement and the Israeli state expresses itself internally in the relationship between the citizen. For Kaplan, the commitment of the Israeli state to democracy entails that it caters to all religions and resists the temptations to become a Jewish state. In fact, Kaplan explicitly declares, and here I'm quoting from New Zionism, in light of the, those realities, the state of Israel cannot be a Jewish state. Okay? And there are many other instances of Kaplan's universalism, particularly his um, relationship to the classic Zionist idea of Shlila Tagola. Um, but time doesn't permit um, to uh, explicate these. Um, in conclusion, Kaplan's nationalism views as the choices placed before the modern Jew but that a modern Jew has to choose it between um, individual or the nation, self or society, universalism or the particular, as false dichotomies. Kaplan believes that a commitment to the Jewish nation does not have to come at the expense of individualistic values and universalist as aspiration. And he argues that when modern Jewish thinkers pit the, these, these um, values as dichotomy, and forces the Jew to choose one of them, the Jew might very well choose um, universalism and individualism. So therefore, um, Jewish nationalism must accept the commitments of modern Jews towards self-fulfillment and, and the idealistic betterment of humanity and reconstruct itself accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first, I, I know I have a lot of nerve doing this since I'm the one who's disrupted the conference so far. My apologies to Nadav. Please turn off cell phones and, and other devices. Just a quick announcement about questions. Again, as yesterday, as we did yesterday, uh, we're not taking questions orally. Uh, we will be passing around note cards again, and I'll do the litany now. Uh, the email is dan at kaplancenter.org. The website address will be up there once it's up, dan at kaplancenter.org. Uh, Twitter is uh, hashtag Kaplan Conference, one word, or my cell phone, 847-404-3122. Again, 847-404-3122. Yoki? And we'll welcome uh, questions not only about the themes that we are talking about, but about uh, uh, Kaplan in Israel uh, in general. The task I have taken upon myself is uh, much more limited than uh, uh, my two colleagues. Uh, all I want to do in the next two, 20 minutes is to uh, present one book of Kaplan, a book which uh, I uh, quite safely assume most of Kaplan's readers have never read. Uh, nevertheless, I want to argue that it might be one of the most important books Kaplan have ever, has ever uh, written and should be uh, deeply discussed and in order to do so, translated and uh, republished. Um, before entering into the theme, I want to, this is a book, it exists. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, uh, my friends, uh, Eric Kaplan and Mel Skold for helping me with uh, a bit of the overhead information regarding this book. I'm talking about the book Ha'emuna Vehamusar, the one book uh, of Kaplan that uh, was originally written, though originally written in English, appeared uh, only in Hebrew translation. Uh, Ha'emuna Vehamusar, Faith and uh, Ethics or Morality. Uh, and even more interesting, the subtitle Life as the Supreme Art, Ha'chaim Ka'omanut Ha'elyona. Um, just uh, to give a bit of uh, background about the book, um, the uh, text uh, is based on Kaplan's um, lectures in Hebrew, notes taken in English. I'm speaking in English and the notes are taken in Hebrew, so are very equivalent. Uh, uh, when he uh, was uh, teaching at Hebrew University, the School of Education at Hebrew University, um, and um, upon returning to the States, 
he uh, decided to uh, publish it <coughs> and uh, made contact with uh, uh, an Israeli writer sitting at that time in uh, New York corresponding for the uh, Israeli uh, newspaper Davar named Yitzhak Ivri um, and uh, uh, asked him to translate uh, the book. Somehow uh, the translator, a very good translator, a bit archaic Hebrew, but a very, very deep Hebrew and a much, much better language than uh, other uh, translations, uh, Hebrew translations of uh, Kaplan's uh, books. Um, uh, somehow he didn't want his name to be um, um, explicitly there, so the only thing you have, you don't have uh, uh, a year of publishing, it was uh, 1954, and you don't have the name of the translator, the only thing you know is that uh, this translation was done in collaboration and certainly with the blessing of the author of Mordechai Kaplan. So this is a book, and um, since it was published uh, in Hebrew at least uh, till the last 10-15 uh, years, uh, the Hebrew uh, uh, audience of uh, Kaplan, the Hebrew, Hebrew reading uh, 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 circle of Kaplan uh, was very limited, and uh, most of the um, discussion about Kaplan took place in English, and uh, I took naturally uh, in account mostly his English uh, uh, texts. Uh, the book was almost uh, neglected and very, very uh, um, rarely uh, discussed. This book uh, um, is very different than anything that we know uh, uh, out of Kaplan. I use uh, your uh, 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 expression uh, again. The, almost the entire grocery list of Kaplan does not appear here. You won't find Judaism as a civilization. You won't find Jewish peoplehood. There's a very little uh, general discussion about uh, uh, the need to reconstruct uh, religion. You won't find uh, Hebraism and many other uh, areas. What you, you will find is a universalistic approach to the question of life as an art, of understanding human life altogether. The point of view is certainly Jewish, the point of view is certainly American Jewish, uh, uh, modern American Jewish uh, point of view, but from this point of view, the discussion is fully universalistic. He speaks about religion, he speaks about human being. He speaks about societies. He speaks about nationalities. The examples and, and uh, the discourse uh, um, uh, reveals very easily that it's a Jew, it's an American Jew who speaks about it, but uh, he's not interested there uh, explicitly with the Jewish people, but with peoples, with the uh, Jewish religion, but with religions uh, all together. At the center, at the heart, of faith is a double nature of the human uh, uh, creature. On the one hand, human creatures have uh, the tendency for the individualization of uh, getting, of uh, uh, receiving as much strength and good from the environment, of um, kind of egoism, of strength, but on the other hand, to a no lesser extent, it is uh, embedded in our nature as human beings that we tend to cooperate, to uh, um, build societies, to uh, aspire morality and the good. So uh, human, the human uh, creature, different than many uh, natural creatures around us is double natured. And that's why human culture and human societies and religions have both approaches. And when we look at religions um, in kind of an overview, what we can see is that there are two basic motivations that rule religious uh, moves. The one motivation, which is called here in this book a teorgic uh, motivation, is that we want God to help us to achieve the maximal um, achievement that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, think of. That we want God or the gods 
not to uh, uh, harm us, not to weaken us, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to expand our ability through religion. But the other motivation of religion that we wish God to limit us, to teach us what is good, to direct us not to do everything that we could have done, but to do only that which could implement the divine in our being. Now, we are, I'm sure we are all aware of the regular way Kaplan speaks about layers in religion. He speaks about uh, uh, magic religion, about uh, um, a ritual religion, and he speaks about the need to upgrade religion into, into the ethical uh, level. This contradiction, contradiction appears here in a much more interesting way, at least to my understanding, it's not that much about layers, about development, it's about two basic contradicting directions. And our task in constructing, and he does speak about reconstructing uh, a religion, though in a very general uh, way, is to prefer ethical religion, namely to use religion, namely to stick to religion uh, as an ethical tool, rather as a tool to um, make us, to so empower our abilities, to so empower our uh, behaviors. The book was written in 1954. You can see um, on one hand a very clear um, expression of uh, Kaplan's modernism, of his understanding of the wonderful achievements modern life could, uh, can bring to us uh, we heard uh, yesterday about uh, uh, Judaism and, and, and uh, technology, uh, about the um, um, development, the progress in, uh, in, in, in human, uh, humanism, in, in, in values. Nevertheless, we're in 1954. He doesn't speak about the Holocaust, but the Holocaust is certainly present here. And very much, I believe, in the same sense as we... Uh, uh, heard about uh, Heschel, um, the Holocaust, and Hiroshima uh, as two sides of the same coin. And uh, he's very, very aware of the fact that for every step forward that we have done, uh, we are doomed to uh, uh, take at least two, three steps backwards. And he says, and I almost quote here, if we did not believe in God, we, were the, we would have been doomed to be de totally despaired for human being. It is only thanks to the deep belief in God that we can still believe that human beings not only can choose the right way, but might uh, um, really do it. So at the essence of uh, the entire book, there is not a description of human life. There is a deep faith in the divine nature embedded in our life, though in many cases not fully exercised, though covered by uh, natural physical layers that we uh, uh, normally uh, meet. And this approach is a deep expression of, well, maybe being at the edge of rationalism. I would say crossing the line to an irrationalistic faith. Not that much uh, thanks to the way Kaplan speaks here about God, but due to the way he speaks about uh, man. The divine element, the essential divine element in the human is something that we choose to appreciate, is something that we choose to believe in. We heard yesterday, maybe some of you remember uh, the very uh, nice uh, saying of uh, one of Heschel's uh, ancestors, the Ohev Yisrael, saying that um, we normally speak about God from our, from our human point of view. 
And the of Israel added, just think, how would uh, God speak about uh, human beings? I dare say that what Kaplan is doing here is trying to speak about human species, about society, about us, from the way he could think God would have sp spoken about us. So it's not that much about God, but about the divine in the human uh, our society, the divine in the human existence. The motto of uh, the book points to a thinker I'm not that uh, sure all of you are familiar with. As far as I know, uh, Kaplan has uh, written very little about him, but here he is uh, uh, cited in the motto. I'm talking about Aaron David Gordon. Um, the um, father of social, uh, so utopian socialist religious Zionism uh, in Eretz Israel, a friend teacher of Martin Buber, um, the person who uh, introduced into the Hebrew language uh, the word Chavaya, Erlebnis in German, experience, but experience is a very weak translation of uh, uh, both Erlebnis and, and, uh, and, and, and Chavaya. The word Chavaya comes uh, from the same root as Chayim, like Erlebnis and Leben. And it was uh, Aaron David Gordon who pointed to the fact that we human beings are holistically uh, uh, comprised not divided, holistically comprised by uh, um, knowing, by science, and by the Chavaya. And it was Gordon who has put at the heart of uh, uh, the idea of uh, Chavaya the notion of responsibility, the regesh ha'achrayut, ha'regesh ha'dati, the sense of uh, responsibility, the religious sense. It was Gordon who highly uh, appreciated uh, the particularity of the Jewish people and nevertheless opposed, firmly opposed the notion of the election of Israel. Because for him, the Jewish particularity was universalistic and, in, and directed to the individual in the very way we have heard from uh, uh, Ari Ackerman, like all other healthy particularities. And um, it was Aaron David Gordon who defined faith as the basic existential decision, basic existential decision, whether when we introduce, when we, when we confront in the word chaos, despair, Evil, on the one hand, harmony, good, divine uh, 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 grace, on the other hand, that we choose to see the universe as essentially ruled by sikhliyut na'alama, mysterious uh, um, intellect, intellect, but intellect here means uh, uh, reasoning, uh, uh, meaning, and then from this point of view to confront uh, uh, the other, the, the uh, contradicting phenomena as well, rather than to see the, uh, um, the universe as basically senseless, uh, 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 godless, and then to say, okay, there are some islands of, uh, of harmony, some islands of beauty, some islands of uh, 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 isolated islands of, uh, of, uh, of meaning in, in the world. And Gordon is taking a very, very similar path here to, to and, and Kaplan is taking a very similar path here to uh, Gordon, though from a very different, uh, out of a very different uh, a philosophical background. And, and, and hence he can speak about um, life as a supreme art. Once you speak about life as art, 
you depart from a rigid uh, rationalism. Yes, there are uh, um, rational, rationalistic elements in, in, in the way you perceive life, but uh, you go much, much uh, beyond it. I don't know if uh, some of you could see uh, when, when uh, Nadav was uh, showing us uh, the wonderful picture of uh, 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 Yeshaya Leibovitch. There was a Hebrew uh, uh, writing on the blackboard uh, behind him. And it said that uh, science has to do with uh, logical uh, conclusions and values have to do with, um, uh, with, with basic existential decisions, sachraot. And that's exactly what Kaplan is doing here. He tells us from which point of view, from which primordial existential uh, uh, point of view one ought to, to measure uh, the entire uh, uh, um, phenomena we meet in life and, uh, 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 and, and make uh, uh, practical decisions. Just l uh, last, uh, uh, last thing. Kaplan is um, described slash cues, use uh, uh, the word you want, for many times for not being a theologian but rather a sociologist. He speaks, he analyzes the function of faith, the way religions, uh, anthropologists, theologists, the way uh, religions have emerged, function, do things. Here in this book, you can deeply sense the theologian in Kaplan, the deep, deep believer in Kaplan, and again, he does, he does here too uh, speak about religion. He does speak about uh, the way he, he described religion, but he described religion from a religious point of view, from a faithful point of view. And he asks himself, how can religions really uh, benefit? How can religious really contribute to faith? I'll just repeat the last sentence uh, uh, that I've already said. At the heart of his faith is not that much a kind of saying about God, a kind of description of God, a kind of conceptualization of God. There is a deep faith that that which we live, that which is commanded upon us, that who we are, bears in itself a divine component, and this divine component is that which makes uh, life human, namely godly. Thanks to all. So we are not off schedule. We are on, pardon me, a reconstructed schedule. And it's all going to work out. So with, uh, thank you for the indulgence of the next panel, particularly. Don't worry. Um, OK, first question for Dr. Ackerman. By your definition, are the Palestinians a nation? That is, do they have the characteristics and resources you listed? Um, I I'm a scholar, and I've always uh, avoided um, trying um, questions like that. But <laughs> <laughs> Your call. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I'll try to relate it to Kaplan's thought. And one of the things I found interesting and also problematic about Kaplan's Zionism is that he really does not relate to the, to the Arab question. Um, I found one very, very brief comment in New Zionism where he talks about the need to um, have a, uh, a, to offer a pragmatic solution for the Arab refugee problem. But even in ethical nationalism that was written in the 70s, there, there's a nationhood, thank you, um, that was written in the 70s and there's an entire chapter on Zionism in the state of Israel. Um, I think there's almost no reference 
to the Arabs and when he talks about reconstructing the state of Israel and the universalistic elements in the state of Israel, it's generally about religious pluralism um, and other intra-Jewish um, issues. Um, in terms of my, my personal opinion, I would say that, you know, certainly that uh, um, uh, Palestinian nations, the Palestinian nation has uh, all these features. And I think Kaplan would also agree with that today. Okay. And now for, for any of you, um, what do you think the idea of Kaplan's focus on Judaism serving the individual and the universal has to say to the Reconstructionist movement today, and how might it differ from the Reform Movement or the message as heard by the Reform Movement? Well, the Reform Movement was mentioned, so I'll, I'll, I'll pop it. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it was, it was uh, discussed yesterday, but I wish to say I think that a lot that has been uh, uh, happening in the reform movement uh, made the contemporary uh, uh, reform phenomena much, much closer to Kaplan than in, in, in the times of Kaplan. Uh, I have the experience when teaching, uh, especially American uh, uh, rabbis to be, um, and talking about Kaplan, and uh, they uh, hardly can see what's unique about it, and how, hardly can see uh, how should it be different than that which they have heard uh, in their uh, religious schools and in their, um, uh, um, you know, reform being. This has to say that reform, uh, uh, that re the reform movement, especially the grassroots of the reform movement, has moved uh, very, very profoundly to the direction that Kaplan was advocating. And, uh, um, and, and, and the, the, the question, it's a question of uh, organizations, to which extent reconstructionist movement and, and, and reform movement today are really different or to what extent they are different, this is not uh, 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 my, my thing. The, the thing is that there is something very deeply reconstructionist in the contemporary reform movement and what do the uh, reconstructionists do with it? It's, uh, it's their... Uh, um, it, it, it's their challenge. What it is uh, um, vitally important in, in Kaplan's uh, thought, and I think it's vitally important both for America, uh, North American Jewry and for Israeli Jewry, is the idea of uh, um, collectivism which is based on the individual Namely, we need society, we need responsibility for society. Our being part of uh, an environment is essentially important for us, but only when it puts in its heart the individual, only when it serves the individual, only when it's not a collectivism per se, but collectivism for the sake of the individual. And in the same way, particularism, which is uh, um, a stage towards universalism, an understanding that particularism and universalism are not contradictory to each other, but to the contrary, all of us human beings are particular particular as individuals and particular as groups. And when those groups exercise their uniqueness and contribute to the entirety of humanity and to the well-being of other particularities, then we fulfill our uh, mission. When we lo lock ourselves in, uh, uh, in a particularity that uh, lives only for the sake of itself, then we betray not only humanism, but also our particularity. So for anyone who wants to jump in, uh, we've, we've been asked, please comment further on the conflict between Kaplan's conception of Jewish uh, uh, nationalism and the nature and identity of Israel as a Jewish state. It's a good question. Um, well, you mentioned it. Can, can, <laughs> definitely. I'm, I'm thinking again about, about Dan, about the specific, can you please articulate it again, Dan? Yes, I'm just. Um, 
Potentially multimedia multitasking. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, Please, I'll read it again. Please comment further on the conflict between Kaplan's conception of Jewish nationalism and the nature and identity of Israel as a Jewish state. Yes. So it seems to me like, like a good question um, because it really puts together the different framings of, of the American uh, policy making or, or politics or the framing of how society is built and the Israeli one. I think the, one of the interesting aspects of, of Kaplan's uh, thought is whether it will be pragmatic. I mean, whether a, a Jewish state or even binational unified state can, can really happen. And, and the interesting thing is, or, or maybe the really challenging one, is we have the, the clash of civilizations, a term mentioned yesterday um, in Israel, because we have a, a really uh, various uh, way of, ways of thinking in Israel is it really challenging the, the American conceptions, uh, but maybe has a, a, to donate to, to the American ways of, uh, of thinking. Uh, I'm not sure that it will really work if Israel were to be a, a natural a state. And this is, of course, not uh, saying anything about the, the need to, to found a, a Palestinian state. Uh, it's now being uh, negotiated, hopefully happening. But, but the question, I think, is first of all in the Jewish perspe perspective about the shaping of, of Israel as a state. And here we have really challenging questions about the, the relation between uh, church and state or dat ve medina as uh, coined in the Israeli aspect. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. um, I, I think on the one hand, obviously, Kaplan would, uh, would object to and be critical of, of the current state of um, religion within the public sphere of, of Israeli society. And I think the, the quote I brought was, was relating specifically to the issue of, of the need for religious, Jewish religious pluralism within the public sphere. On the other hand, I don't think Kaplan was advocating a separation between church and state. I think he thought that the Israel state should, one, one of its goals should be the reconstruction of Judaism. And that would necessitate um, a, a Jewish state in the sense of Judaism being part of the public sphere of, of Israeli society. You know, how that would fit in with, with other religions and, and other cultures, uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure of the, of the particulars and how that would be negotiated, but I think Kaplan would not advocate a strict separation between church and state. I think he would advocate a creative Jewish pluralistic um, public sphere, and in that sense there would be a Jewish state, but a very different type of Jewish state. I add to it, uh, A, I think that what Kaplan means is that uh, he wouldn't like to see Israel as a solely Jewish state, and uh, he would uh, love to see not only inner Jewish pluralism, but uh, 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 a deep recognition of the fact that uh, Israel, Israeli society is comprised by Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Arabs and others, and uh, uh, in a democratic system, uh, not only individuals have to find their, way, their place there, but also societies and um, uh, sectors of, uh, of the society. So uh, this is one thing. The other, the other uh, the comment I wish to make is that I find Kaplan's um, uh, formulation of so-called uh, dual uh, uh, loyalty uh, of American Jews uh, highly fruitful also for Israeli Jews. Kaplan was advocating the idea that uh, Jews in North America live in, in two uh, civilizations, in two religions. And uh, uh, they, are, they have in common with all the Jews around the world, the Jewish peoplehood, and they have in common with all the Americans, American nationhood. 
And um, uh, many of you are aware of the fact that uh, uh, a very late publication of uh, Kaplan together with uh, two uh, um, uh, um, uh, Christian uh, clergy was to create a book of the faith of America. How do we Americans, Jews and non-Jews alike, celebrate uh, the um, festivals of the American religion? Um, it was not that uh, warmly welcomed, but I think that uh, if we think about the same formulation from an Israeli point of view, uh, it would allow me as an Israeli to share with all of you the togetherness of Klal Israel, of, uh, of Jewish peoplehood, of Jewish religion on the one hand, and here the fact that we might belong to two different communities, to two different spheres is less important, much more important than is that which we have in common. And on the other hand, my other belonging, civilization, I dare say religion, is the Israeli one, where I share the commonalities, not with you guys, but with the Palestinians and, and, and others, other non-Jews who live, who live in Israel. And where I have to respect the fact that for them, the Israeli being is not seeing, is, should not, cannot be seen from a Jewish point of view, and, uh, but from a different point of view. And that would mean, and if I can recall uh, um, a very interesting suggestion that uh, um, the um, ex -supreme, retired Supreme Judge uh, um, um, Miriam Ben Porat has raised uh, uh, about uh, 14 years ago, that Israel should have two national anthems. One can be Hatikva, where we, where we uh, 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 express a Jewish understanding of what Israel is all, all about, but there should be another national song that would allow Israelis, when they are together, and not necessarily in a Jewish environment, not only to tolerate the fact that Israel is there, not only to tolerate that some people love Israel, but to be part of it. I, I we are just, far from it, but we, uh, one, we should reach one it. Yeah, right. I, I agree with Yoki that, that, that Kaplan's thought is fruitful in that respect, but that was not Kaplan's view. In other words, Kaplan looked, had a very inconsistent attitude. His prescription for American society was di very different than his prescription for Israeli society, and they were grounded in different political philosophic assumptions. Because an American Jew, North American Jew, looking at Israel, and when we Israelis uh, read his uh, philosophy, we sometimes yeah. have to overcome the shortcomings of Kaplan I, when, when, I totally understanding, when understanding the Israeli situation, for yeah. sure. That one we will continue at lunch or late this <laughs> afternoon. We have uh, just a few minutes, we're not done, a few minutes and several very important questions, so I'm gonna ask you, I know it's easier for me to ask than for you to do this. Very brief, and maybe only one of you, you know, for each of you. First one is, uh, though, is, is for Yoki. Uh, I'm going to put together two questions about Aleph Dal Gordon, who sparked a lot of interest. First, in citing Gordon, were you implying a direct influence of Gordon on Kaplan? No. I was just saying that uh, Kaplan met Gordon at a very uh, late stage, or might have been the fa uh, 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 and I'm, and, and you have to go to the diary uh, uh, expert, diary expert, but, but I assume that Kaplan met in a late stage of his life, met uh, Gordon and was highly inspired by him. Great, and part two, um, what did Kaplan think of uh, Gordon's uh, Da'at Avodah, his uh, religion of, of Da'at Avodah was never part of uh, Gordon's uh, uh, philosophy. It was, it's, it's a kind of a slogan that was uh, uh, um, kind of force on his uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, Kaplan is certainly close to the kind of um, soft, social democratic uh, uh, idea of Gordon, nevertheless his understanding of society and of, uh, he's, at the end of the day he is a rationalist and, uh, uh, and, and Gordon is uh, an, an irrationalist and there are uh, big differences between them. The next one, I can't resist doing this. So it's, yes. <laughs> I can't resist asking it, but it's really as much for the audience probably as for the panel, but anybody who has a quick comment. Uh, it's about Kaplan's uh, personal relationship with Israel's political leaders, both immediately before uh, and after uh, the creation of the State of Israel. In particular, I'll add, somebody was just asking me about uh, something he had heard, that there was a period, 
think probably in the forward, mid 40s, when um, uh, visiting uh, Israeli political leaders only felt comfortable or, or only welcomed at the SAJ. Um, I'm not sure that's true, but there's a rumor out there, at least that effect. Does anybody have any? Kaplan and, and Ben Gurion as best friends, yeah. Well, Chaim Weitzman was an honorary member of the SAJ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last president, um, yeah, we know uh, Shlomo Riskin goes around making, uh, loves to tell stories about gold in my ears, thinking reconstructionism was not a good idea, but we won't go into that. Um, I'm not sure that Shlomo Riskin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question, um, and this is primarily of, of, um, for Dr. Ackerman. Uh, the questioner says, Kaplan sounds like Rav Cook. I take it means the elder Rav Cook, uh, minus a theology of land. Is that right? Did uh, Kaplan think Jews needed ultimately to be to give up or be prepared to give up on land, Eretz Israel, uh, just as they needed to give up on election? Um, I, I have a very different understanding of Rav Cook. I think they're very um, different thinkers, grounded in very very different assumptions. I'll just just to be brief, I'll, I'll, I'll just relate to one issue. I think in Rav Cook's thought, there's a real tension between the individual and society. There are remarkable passages in Rav Cook's uh, mystical journeys about his need to, uh, to develop himself, and he sees it in tension with his role as a religious leader. So I think uh, in almost all respects, uh, not in all respects, but in many respects, Rav Cook were very, very different thinkers. Uh, not, not about Rav Cook. Just to clarify, I, I realize that it was not that clear. The book Haimunava Musar appeared only in Hebrew. Our friend Mel Scott believes to have in possession some of the English par partial uh, manuscript of the book. At the moment, some of it can be read in English only when you go to uh, Mel's uh, apartment, and <laughs> some of it cannot be uh, read in English anyway. I would uh, wish to encourage all of us to, to uh, press hard on the uh, Kaplan Center to uh, uh, make this book uh, appear in English with good uh, annotation, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, expand in a very interesting and essential way, the discussion about Kaplan and make some of the uh, things that we perceive as um, clear and, um, and, and, um, uh, um, and, and simple uh, regarding to Kaplan, much more uh, complicated, much more interesting, and, if, and maybe uh, hence also much more relevant to, to uh, 21st century life. And just to make it clear, that was not a setup, but it was, from my point of view, absolutely a call for funding. As Aoki knows, we've been, uh, we've been talking about this project. In the meantime, with Mel's permission, we will put at least excerpts uh, of the, uh, the, what's currently in Mel's apartment, as you say, up on our website. So stay tuned for that. So thank you to all of the three of you. Thank you.